So, it's been a while since I've talked about a show I actually like on this channel, so we're having a bit of a change of pace today. I know you guys love to hear me ranting and going crazy over stupid stuff that pisses me off, but you know, sometimes I need to talk about things I love for my own sanity. And to be completely honest, I was not planning on making a video about this show at all. I just wanted to enjoy it on my own time after going through some stuff. But by the time I finished the first episode, I knew I had to talk about Fleabag. And don't get me wrong, I knew the show was good, I had heard great things about it, but now that I've watched it, I'm actually surprised people aren't talking about it more. It deserves way more attention. I mean, yes, it won a bunch of awards over the years and blah blah blah, but award shows are meaningless and I refuse to give them credit for anything aside from being way too long and boring to watch. No, this show deserves more love from audiences, so if I can contribute a little bit, I will well, even if somebody got strangely triggered when I announced on Instagram that Fleabag was going to be my next video and sent me the most awkwardly aggressive message to express that. No. Just no. This show was made by a woman for women. You do not get to go around and speak about this show like it belongs to you. It is simply not your place. I am so tired of straight men shamelessly taking what isn't theirs away from women. It is disrespectful, misogynistic, and we do not need that toxicity anymore. This is not for you to talk about. So know your place and go back to talking about teen dramas. This show was not made for you. Could you imagine a man wanting to celebrate a show made by a woman? How insulting. The audacity. The nerve. Well, it's too bad for you, Karen, because I love this show and I'm gonna talk about it whether you like it or not. You're free to yell at me on Twitter for that. You know, what's the saying again? Gas keep gate boss girl light. Yeah, something like that. But yeah, I didn't expect to love Fleabag that much. This show is really special for a number of reasons, and it's difficult to pinpoint what makes it so great. There are just too many elements working together here, but I'm gonna try to explain it. Now, for those who don't know, Fleabag was created and written by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who also stars as the main character. The show is actually an adaptation of a play she wrote and performed back in 2013, and it was apparently pretty successful as well. Now, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is an absolute genius, both as an actress and as a writer. And I, for one, am very happy to see her get more and more opportunities in Hollywood. Since Fleabag, she notably wrote and produced the show Killing Eve. She's a co-writer of the upcoming James Bond movie No Time to Die. She's set to appear in the next Indiana Jones. She was in Solo, a Star Wars story. And she is set to produce and star in the upcoming TV adaptation of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And I think it's fair to assume that Fleabag, being such a home run, is a big fan actor in Phoebe's incredible success. Now, if you know my channel, you are probably aware of the fact that I'm not a big fan of the term masterpiece, because I think it's a word people throw around way too easily these days, but I do think Fleabag is deserving of that title, and we're gonna talk about it, but before we do that, I just wanna take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, Surfshark. Guys, as you know, the internet can be quite terrifying at times. You never really know what's out to get you, you know, it's dangerous in these streets. That's why it's important to make sure you're safe while you're hanging out on the internet, and that's where Surfshark comes into play. Surfshark is a VPN service that protects your information by encrypting all the data you send through the internet. In other words, on your devices, Surfshark makes sure that you're Batman and that no one can see you unless you want them to. But that's not all of it. Another great reason to use a VPN is because content from streaming services can be restricted based on what country you're in. With Surfshark, you can solve that problem by simply changing your location. Not only is this good for people who want to keep up with their favorite shows, but it can also be a critical tool for people who live in countries that heavily censor and monitor its citizens. You can just set your location to, I don't know, Canada, and boom, here's Netflix. Now you can watch Stranger Things. And the best part of it is that Surfshark doesn't keep tabs on any of your activity. Right now, Surfshark is offering a pretty good deal. By using my link in description and promo code NINJA, you will get 83% off. Which means for something like a couple bucks a month, you can be fully protected. And you'll get three months for free, because they're just 
just nice like that. Surfshark also offers a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you try it and you don't like it, you can simply cancel your subscription, get your money back and buy yourself a chocolate bar or something. Thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video and let's get back to the show. So Fleabag is the story of, well, her, this woman played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge. People say her name is Fleabag, but in the show itself, we actually never find out what her name is and no one ever refers to her as Fleabag, but for the sake of this video, we're just gonna call her Fleabag. Fleabag is a down on her luck 20 something woman who is trying to navigate her life after the sudden passing of her best friend and things are not looking too great for her. She owns a failing cafe and she can't afford to keep it open and she has a lot of relationship problems. It's the most I can say about it as far as synopsis goes because the show doesn't have a particular point A to point B story which is surprisingly effective here. Fleabag is very much a show about the intricacies and the challenges of being a human being in this modern world and more specifically for her the challenges of being a woman in this modern world. But first off I feel like I have to address something. When it comes to storytelling Fleabag does something that I have grown to appreciate more and more in the last recent years. It ends. Yeah, I know, it sounds stupid said like that, but I mean it. When I announced I was making this video, lots of people were talking about how they're sad that Fleabag will not have more seasons, and I fundamentally disagree with these people. Phoebe Waller-Bridge had a plan for this character, she executed it, and then she ended the story. Fleabag has two seasons, that's it, then it's over. You don't get more Fleabag, there's no prequel, there's no spin-off, there's no movie tie-in, it just ends. Phoebe didn't stretch the story, she didn't try to endlessly continue it just because it was successful and there was more money to be made, no, she told the story she wanted to tell and then she peaced out and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate and respect that. It's okay to let a story end and it will probably be better for it. And believe it or not, the fact that you crave more when it ends is actually a great sign, it means the show ended on a high note and you should be happy about that. Too many shows today go like this, start a show with a great concept. Get the audience interested in that concept. Tell the story that was originally intended to be told. When it ends, go way past the story that was originally intended to be told. Keep going for as long as possible just for the sake of making more money. Ruin the show in the process because there is no longer any reason for it to exist and eventually get to the point where the show is so unwatchable or boring or just endless that audiences become tired of it and abandon the show in droves. Until the network is forced to cancel the show and award it an inevitably disappointing and anticlimactic final season. Too many shows today just refuse to end on their own terms and it never ends well for them. I cannot tell you how many shows I fell in love with and ended up hating because it just didn't know when to end and it kept going on and on. And because of that I've grown to really really appreciate when a show can recognize that it's time to go. That's what I've been saying that I hope season 3 of Sex Education is the last one. Not because I hate the show and I want to see it go but because I love it and I don't want it to risk ruining itself by becoming too long and endlessly stretching the story. I'll take three seasons of great television over eight seasons of mediocre shit with one or two good seasons somewhere in there any day. The end of the fucking world did the exact same thing. Two seasons and out. Dark was treated by the writers like a trilogy. The plan was always to do three seasons and they stuck to it. Same for The Leftovers. And I really think that's why these shows will be remembered as all time greats in the future because they refuse to ruin themselves endlessly just for the sake of making more money. I mean, I poke a lot of fun at Supernatural, but I stand by the fact that this show should have ended in season 5. I also don't think Stranger Things should have continued after season 2, and that's already pushing it because I think the ending of season 1 is perfect. But anyways, you get the point. I am perfectly okay with Fleabag having only 2 seasons, and you should too. Now that I've seen the show, I can't really picture a Fleabag season 6, like that's weird to me. This show is precious as fuck, and I like that it exists in its own little bubble of creativity. Don't burst the little bubble. I really like how this show makes a point of deconstructing the fundamental values of its characters in the most subtle ways. It makes the characters really interesting, especially because most of them are designed to be utterly unlikable. Everyone in this show is an asshole everyone. But the show still wants you to get to know them, and it somehow manages to make them attaching, which is weird because they don't particularly change by the end. They're still assholes in the final episode, but 
but they're assholes you kinda care about now. Fleabag in particular really hammers in this concept really well. Genuinely, sometimes as an audience, it's really hard to like her. When you meet her in the show, Fleabag is a mess. She doesn't have her life together, and you could say she has a bit of a self-destructive personality. Like, she's a little toxic. When things are going well for her, she systematically finds a way to fuck it up for herself. She's not quite a monster or anything, but objectively, she's still a pretty bad person. She's kind of rude and weirdly hostile towards people who don't necessarily deserve it. She insults people very casually. She's a bit of a kleptomaniac, a pathological liar. She's manipulative as hell. She picks fights with people out of nowhere, and most of the time, she doesn't even know why she does it. She just can't help herself. But what I like about her character is that she is aware of it. The very first episode of Fleabag is more or less about her realizing that she doesn't really like who she is as a person. She doesn't feel like she's fit for the expectations society have of her as an adult and as a woman. The big theme of the pilot is pretty much the struggle of being a modern woman, and you watch the whole episode as Fleabag kind of crumbles under the pressure of fitting this ridiculous standard of the modern woman sold by feminists. You know, the woman who is expected to be a perfect and invincible girl boss who doesn't need anyone for anything, never asks for help because she's independent and succeeds at everything and is expected to have her entire life figured out and never struggle ever because women can do it all and you have to act accordingly as a woman of adult age. But being all of that for anybody regardless of gender comes at a cost psychologically, especially if you're not succeeding at it and you compare yourself to others who are more successful. And the character of Fleabag is a direct representation of that. Oh, fuck it. I have a horrible feeling that I'm a greedy, perverted, selfish, apathetic, cynical, depraved, morally bankrupt woman who can't even call herself a feminist. Well. Wow. This show also pokes a lot of fun at some of the extreme ideologies of modern feminism without necessarily insulting them, but it allows itself to acknowledge that certain of these beliefs are flawed but not inherently bad. And all of it is reflected in Fleabag's troubles. Like I said, Fleabag is kind of an asshole and her own behavior is starting to take a toll on her. Her boyfriend left her, her only friend is dead, her sister cannot stand to be in her presence, her father doesn't like her very much either, and her only contact with other humans are are the one night stand she has here and there with men who are not at all interested in her as a person. Fleabag is not just lonely, because loneliness is a state of mind, but she is, in fact, alone. She has nobody to turn to, nobody to call, nobody to connect with, but even when she does attempt to connect with people, she still ruins it for herself every single time. In the first episode, she steals money out of her date's wallet, and when he expresses that he's not too comfortable going back to her place to just have sex, she flips out at him and leaves. Okay, you're a dick. What's going on? You're pathetic. Wait. Wait, don't follow me. I, I wasn't. You, you dropped this. Because, yeah, her dating life is the primary victim of her behaviors. Mostly because there are a lot of things she refuses to admit to herself. For one, Fleabag likes to pretend like she doesn't care about anyone, and not just in front of people. Even when she breaks the fourth wall and lets us into her mind, she's still lying to herself. One great example of that is in season one, when her friend with benefits starts having erection issues in the bedroom. And Fleabag turns to the audience to say that's what happens when a man is starting to catch feelings. She acts like she's annoyed that her casual sex partner is falling in love with her because she supposedly doesn't give a shit. But later, the episode pulls a complete 180 and the guy tells her that he's falling in love with another woman, and he wanted to let Fleabag know that they couldn't see each other anymore because he wants to pursue those feelings. This should be what Fleabag wanted, but when it happens, she's very visibly hurt by it, and she doesn't really know how to handle that. The same thing happens with the character of Harry. Harry is Fleabag's on-again, off-again boyfriend, who she treats like absolute garbage. It's hinted at several times that Fleabag never really cared for him, and he's more of a convenience to her. He's not a very confident guy, so she kind of manipulates him as she wants. Every time they break up, she just waits for him to come back, because that's just what their relationship is like. He empties the apartment, but always leaves one of his little toys on purpose so that he has an excuse to come back later when he misses her. So whenever she hurts his feelings and he breaks up with her, she nags him and acts very confident that he's going to come back. I've really tried to be there for you through this. You can't say I haven't tried. Please don't contact me. Well, 
turn up my house drunk in your underwear. It won't work this time. It will. She completely takes him for granted and gives zero value to their relationship. But one day, after yet another breakup, Harry leaves, but he takes his little figurine with him for the first time, which makes Fleabag realize it might be for good this time. And the thing is, Fleabag doesn't even like Harry all that much. Nothing ever indicates that she has any feelings for him. She thinks he's lame, she doesn't like that he's fragile and emotional. She doesn't enjoy having sex with him because he's too delicate and she likes it rough. In her own words, she doesn't want to make love, she wants to be fucked. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm amazing. He's wasting me. And whenever he's around, she's just not all that interested in him. What she does like about Harry, however, is the attention he gives to her. She likes knowing this guy is at her feet, knowing that she can just wink at him and he will flinch and come crawling back to her as soon as she gets bored of being single. It makes her feel powerful, it makes her feel in control. So when she comes to the realization that Harry broke up with her, but this time he actually moved on, she panics a little and she starts acting desperately desperately to get his attention back. He's still got some stuff at the flats. I've been rolling around in my lingerie all over it, waiting for you to come and collect it. Yeah, but thank you, but you, know, you, can, you can keep those. Hey, do you still wank about me sometimes? No. And that theme carries throughout the entire season. Fleabag eventually gets to a point where everyone makes it explicitly clear to her that they would rather not have her in their lives. They even stop giving her the courtesy of being polite about it. The biggest occurrence of that notably comes from her sister Claire, with who she has a somewhat complicated relationship. Claire, on the surface, is the polar opposite of Fleabag. She is the successful woman feminists aspire to be. She's got it all. She has the pretty house, she's a good mom, a good wife, she's incredibly successful in her career, she's rich and self-made, she's got her shit together, people look up to her, she's insanely beautiful, she's unstoppable at work, she's got a gigantic office that would make a president jealous, it's all perfect. She's the ultimate girl boss, she represents the dream of modern feminism. But then, you start stripping the layers of that success and you quickly realize that despite being so successful at life to the eyes of the outside world, Claire is is just as miserable inside as Fleabag is. She's insanely unhappy, she's crushed under a planet of pressure and anxiety, she's anorexic, she has lost sight of her own personality, she lives her life on autopilot and she doesn't really know what she wants out of life. And as a result, she developed a temper that completely overtook her identity. Claire is always angry and she doesn't know why. She's exhausted and scared, but she can't allow herself to show that to other people because she thinks it will make her a bad feminist or an undesirable woman. But bottling up all these emotions only reinforces the rage she feels inside, and when we meet her, she has a bit of a hard time controlling it. When are you gonna stop bringing that up? When you do something better? I have two degrees, a husband and a Burberry coat. Hair looks nice. Oh, fuck off. Oh, oh, why? Because you can't! Just fuck off on aeroplanes and leave your weird stepson and broken sister to fend for themselves, okay? We are bad feminists. I want my top back, okay? It's fine, everything's fine, everything's totally fine. Sounds like it's fine. Can you please just give me some space? You were standing so close to me. Oh, just open the fucking door. It's been fucking forever. Welcome. Thank you so much. Claire is a spot-on representation of how achieving those standards of the perfect individual in a modern society is not sustainable mentally. She always feels like she's on the verge of a mental breakdown and she's sort of aware of it, but she also seems to live in a perpetual state of denial. And that's where a lot of her issues with her sister come in. And to be clear, Claire and Fleabag do love each other, but they just can't stand being around each other. It's the same with their father. From the first episode, you get the sense that he he doesn't really like Fleabag. He loves her as his daughter, but he doesn't really like her as a person. The interesting part though is when you start getting into the why. You see, on the surface, it looks like the reason Claire hates Fleabag so much is because of her toxicity. Claire is a control freak. She needs to have a lock on everything. She's always worried of what people think of her, so she goes to great lengths to appear as perfect as possible at all times. But Fleabag is a loose cannon. She doesn't follow the rules. She doesn't 
doesn't mind making a scene, she never listens, she doesn't care what people think of her, she's loud and obnoxious, she's like a bulldozer. Everywhere she shows up, things go to shit somehow. Don't be funny or clever or just don't be the center of attention. These people are very important to me, so just don't, okay. don't be yourself. I won't. Fuck's sake. Fleabag can't be trusted, you can't rely on her, so for Claire, being around her is being unable to control anything and it makes her incredibly uncomfortable. But eventually, we find out that her constant rage towards Fleabag is not necessarily due to these things. In season 2, it's revealed that the real reason behind it is envy. Despite her desire for control and success, and despite being a serious woman with goals and aspirations, there is a part of Claire that resents Fleabag for being able to be so careful carefree in life. She cannot stand that, despite all her flaws, Fleabag is more easy to like than her. Because Fleabag can walk into a room and make everybody laugh. That's her thing. She's just a very vibrant person. Claire is not exactly fun as a person. She's serious, and as a result, people treat her very seriously, but she's not sure that she likes that. She hates being around Fleabag in social situations because Fleabag can easily capture the attention of a room and just make things fun, and Claire doesn't like being perceived as the boring one. I would have come up with my own joke if you hadn't put that one in my head. I have my own jokes. I am funny. I am interesting. I knew I shouldn't have brought you here. But she's also unable to let loose and allow herself to be fun. There's a sense of envy there that makes her hostile towards her sister, and it all comes to a head on her birthday. In season 1, Claire's husband Martin tries to kiss Fleabag at her birthday party. And Fleabag tells Claire what happened to convince her to leave him and pursue her dream to move to Finland for her work. But then Martin fucks her over by claiming Fleabag is the one who attempted to kiss him. And since Fleabag is known for being a liar and is not all that reliable, Claire believes Martin immediately. It's hurtful for Fleabag and it's hard to watch as an audience because Fleabag told the truth and we saw it happen. We know she's not lying. It's the first time Fleabag actually tries to do the right thing but she's still getting punished for it. And that confrontation leads us to the big twist of season 1, which I gotta admit, I did not see coming. I mentioned earlier that when the show starts, Fleabag has recently lost her best friend Boo. Boo accidentally killed herself after finding out that her boyfriend cheated on her. She tried to fake a suicide attempt to put herself in the hospital to gaslight her boyfriend into feeling terribly guilty, but it all went wrong and she actually died while executing her plan. So Fleabag is grieving. Boo was her only friend, the only person who truly liked her for who she was. They were like sisters and Boo was the only person she had in her life for real. But then, in a terrifyingly well-executed twist, we find out that Fleabag was the other woman. She's the one who slept with Boo's boyfriend, which kickstarted the series of events that led to her death. But Boo only found out that her boyfriend slept with someone else. She never actually got to know it was her best friend. And Fleabag has been living with that guilt ever since. Her continuously toxic behaviors led to the death of her only friend, and that's why she is questioning herself so much when you meet her in the pilot. She's still trying to process that horrifying reality. And that's why I love this show so much. Fleabag really is a show about the complexities of being human. You know, everyone feels like this is a little bit, and they're just not talking about it. Or I am completely fucking alone. Fleabag is a flawed person, maybe even a bad person, but she sort of means well. She wants to evolve, but change is a journey. You can't snap your fingers and become a different person. I mean, unless you have the Infinity Stones, but I don't have access to that power. She has moments of weakness. She can be selfish, she can be dishonest, she can be mean, but she's not inherently evil. She's just human. And I would say that one of the biggest themes in the show as a whole is the idea that your mistakes in life do not define you. And you shouldn't let people define you by your mistakes. It doesn't matter how bad you fucked up, if you have the will to change and get better, you can always do that. You always have the choice to grow. Because everybody, everybody makes mistakes in life. You've done it, I've done it, Fleabag's done it, even Captain America has made mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, big ones and small ones. And those mistakes have consequences big ones and small ones. The hard part is having to suffer the consequences of your mistakes. It's hard, it's painful, and it 
comes with guilt, which can be quite incapacitating mentally. Facing the consequences of your past mistakes is a real challenge, but the best thing you can do for yourself moving forward is to learn from those mistakes and to keep living your life with that knowledge, to keep trying to be the best person you can be. And that's what growth is. But also, the show really values the idea that showing compassion towards people who have wronged you or made mistakes in the past and are genuinely trying to change and evolve can be integral to their growth, and that notion gives the story a lot of unexpected, very human moments. There's a scene in season 1 where Fleabag sits down with a man she's met once before with who she had a bit of an argument. She encounters this man again under weird circumstances and let's just say she sees him in a position where he probably didn't want people he knows to see him. He's kind of a shitty guy and he has done some shitty things and because that's what I've come to expect from media these days, I was waiting for the show to endlessly mock him and villainize him into oblivion, but that's actually not what happens. Instead of that, you get this weirdly endearing scene where Fleabag and this man sit down and talk. And for a while, Fleabag just listens to what he has to say. She doesn't judge him, she doesn't mock him. In fact, at first she pretends she can't even speak. She just sits there and she listens. I'm just a very disappointing man. I want to move back home. I want to hug my wife. Protect my children, protect my daughter. I want to move on. She listens to this man talk about how disappointed he is with himself and how he wants to change, to be better, to evolve and move on with his life a better man. And while Fleabag has all the reasons in the world to hate this guy and completely dismiss anything he has to say for himself after his gross mistakes, she realizes that in some weird ways, they have more in common than she could have ever expected. He goes to a vulnerable place and it allows her to do the same, and she finds herself having a conversation with this man during which she only says one thing thing, but in that one thing, she's probably being the most honest she's been in a very long time. I just want to cry all the time. And that scene leads to the two building a really beautiful friendship and sense of understanding for one another that's just really inspiring. It's just a great representation of what real human growth is like, and I really appreciate it. Another thing that made me fall in love with the writing of Fleabag is this little thing it does with its continuity. Sometimes the show will just reward you for paying attention, and it's part of its sense of humor. Like, the show will commit to a joke for several episodes, which is such a unique thing. And I'm not talking about an inside joke that will be repeated in every episode. No, what I mean is, the show will set up a joke in one episode, but the punchline will only come like two or three episodes later, and they won't always grab you by the hands and walk you through it so you can get it. You'll get the joke if you paid attention and remember. There's even a punchline in season two including shoes that won't mean anything to you if you forgot a particular scene from season one. The show really values our attention, and I really like that. And the writing is just so tight and well thought out. Season 1 leaves you in a place that could immediately carry on in Season 2, but Phoebe Waller-Bridge decided to take another route that I did not expect. Season 2 surprisingly starts over a year after the events of Season 1, and we're introduced to a new and improved Fleabag. She's still not quite perfect, but she is way ahead of her Season 1 self. She has a bit more control over her life now, her business is doing well, she's more at peace with herself, she's just in a much better place. And I won't say too much about season 2 because I really think that's something you should experience while knowing as little about it as possible, but I will say that the first episode of season 2 is just brilliant. I think it's my favorite episode of the entire show. Because it was such a brilliant way to reintroduce all of these characters after the time jump. The first episode of season 2 takes place entirely at a table during a dinner, and it's so well written that it stays captivating the whole way through. Every time the conversation evolves, every time the topic changes, you can feel the tension rise and rise and rise, and you know something is about to explode, but you don't know what yet. You don't know who at the table 
table is gonna be the first one to crack, but everyone is trying their best to keep their composure. And the entire time, they're just sitting at a table. That's a really hard thing to do, to make an entire episode of television that is taking place at a table. You have to be really good at writing to pull that off. But the show pulls it off perfectly. It's such a great episode of television. And that episode also leads to Fleabag meeting a priest who becomes an integral part of the season and with who she starts developing the deepest bond she's experienced since the death of her best friend. But that's all I'm gonna say about season two. Seriously, if you haven't seen Fleabag, watch it. It's so good and so unique. And most of all, it's so easy to watch. It's only 12 episodes and not 12 episodes per season. The whole show is 12 episodes and it goes by really quickly. Fleabag is a great binge, and even though I'm a little late to the party, I'm actually glad I only watched the show now. I didn't realize that before I started working on this video, but the first season of Fleabag came out in 2016, and season 2 came out in 2019, three years later? That's a long-ass wait for a show that only has six episodes per season. So I'm actually super glad that I got to experience it all at once, because Fleabag doesn't really feel like a show. Binging it felt like watching two three-hour movies, and I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of it. It just feels so real because this show is not interested in the grandiose. If you go into Fleabag expecting scenes with excessive emotion and declarations and over-dramatization of everything like we're used to seeing in American shows, you're probably gonna be disappointed. This show is not about the big moments. On the contrary, Fleabag is all about the importance of the little things. And that's why it's so good and so refreshing. Even if it doesn't sound like your cup of tea, it's great, I promise you, Give it a chance, you won't regret it. I have my little nitpicks about the show. Some of the music cues get incredibly repetitive after a while and it became irritating, but I binged the show in one day, so that's probably why. Some people have criticized the show for being quite lacking in diversity, and yes, it's hard not to notice. I think there's only three or four very minor characters of color in the whole show, and you're lucky if they appear in more than one scene. The important characters in the show are all white, and it's not the best, honestly, but I mean, I still enjoyed the show. Fleabag doesn't come across as white people, the series. But it is an unfortunate lack of diversity. The criticism is 100% valid. The one big nitpick I have with Fleabag is that season two goes a certain direction with the idea of the fourth wall breaking and it didn't really land with me. It's kind of this Deadpool thing where the show alludes to the fact that Fleabag knows she's a character in a TV show and she meets a certain character that starts to notice something is off when she turns to the camera and talks to the audience. I get why it's there. It was a strange meta way for the show to portray their genuine connection building over time. I get the trick. It's clever and it makes sense, but I don't know. It felt like an offbeat extra step and it took me out of it most of the time. It just didn't compute with me. It kind of broke the level of suspension of disbelief that's required to accept that Fleabag talks to the audience. But some people might disagree with me on that. I don't know. But I'm really reaching here. There's not a lot about this show that I dislike. It looks great. It's insanely well written, the dialogue is so fun, the performances are all amazing. Some characters are a bit underdeveloped, but they're all memorable in their own way, so it didn't bother me too much. Overall, Fleabag is a brilliant show. It's weird, it's definitely a strange series, but it's just too good and unique. Phoebe Waller-Bridge just carries this role with an iron fist. She's so great in this and she deserves all the love she's getting. I adore her, she's a genius and I wish her all the best and I will forever admire her for ending the show after two seasons. I will be re-watching Fleabag a lot and knowing that it's just 12 fantastic episodes of TV every time will always bring me comfort. Seriously, there isn't a single bad episode in the whole show. I love it. It felt so good to fall in love with a show like that again, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Tell the truth. It's horrendous. It's horrendous. It's modern. Don't lie! I'm not! I look like a pencil. Oh.